Welcome everyone to another session where we're connecting with uh, global experts in digital learning, teaching, and the impact that online has on what happens in classrooms uh, across the country and across the world. Uh, privileged today to chat with probably my longest standing collaborator, uh, Stephen Downs from the National Research Council of Canada. Stephen, welcome. Can you provide a little bit of a background to yourself? Hi, George. Uh, did you just use onlining as a verb? I did. <laughs> the, the great onlining. The great onlining. Okay. I work with the National Research Council of Canada, as you said. Uh, I've been involved in online learning for 25, 30 years now, I guess, depending on how you count it. Um, with NRC, I've been at it for 20 years. I also worked with Athabasca University for seven years. Um, I worked with the University of Alberta, built a, a portal for them, Assiniboine Community College for four and a half years. Um, and yeah, I've done a bunch of things online, and it's many of which were with you, George. <laughs> Well, and one of the things, and I'll mention this right up front for people who are, who are listening, uh, your newsletter remains, I think, probably the standard in the ed tech field. If you're not familiar with it, it's OL Daily, or if you go to Downs, D-O-W-N-E-S dot C-A, uh, you can sign up uh, at the site. It's probably the most diverse topic area. You cover everything from educational trends, learning sciences research through to technology, technology innovation, philosophy, social implications, and the list goes on. So I think it really has remained for over 20 years now the go-to newsletter in the ed tech space. So I certainly encourage people to uh, sign up and, and join along and we'll include a link in the course as well. So with that as background, you, you've covered great territory uh, in your own career and what what are you doing currently with your research? What's been the profile of your research over the last 20 years at NRC? <laughs> well, the profile has been, oh, I was going to say spiraling down, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I've always been interested in open online learning, and that's been a theme throughout. I've always been interested in decentralized and networked learning, and that's a theme throughout. I've gone from learning objects to educational blogging to web 2.0, MOOCs, you, uh, to personal learning environments. Uh, these days, I'm still interested in all of those things, but uh, you know, more recently, uh, I've gotten interested in some of the uh, web 3.0 uh, decentralized technologies, including but not limited to blockchain and stuff like that. We could talk about that. People wave their hands at it, uh, but there's some interesting stuff there. I'm also in the middle of writing something called uh, Ethics, Analytics, and the Duty of Care. Uh, I call this my accidental book project because I intended for it to be a paper, but uh, just listing out the issues involved is a paper length section uh, of that work. So that's been interesting to me. And of course, I've been a part of the great onlining, as you call it. And <laughs> it hurts to say that word. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. But, you know, and that's one of the things that with your background and, and your background ha has, uh, you know, you, you've got a profile in many different spaces, which brings together, I think, an interesting confluence of expertise. And the experience, on the one hand, you are with, have been inside the academy. You are now with the National Research Council. So you are still very much part of what you would call sort of a traditional research enterprise. And yet a good portion of your work has also been about agitating toward change that moves some of the ability for control and influence to the individual, to the individual mm -hmm. student and the individual learner. I know just a couple of days ago on your newsletter, you uh, have, took issue with someone who had stated that, you know, this online needs to be constructive, planned and focused. And your response is, no, no, like these tools give power to individual people. It's messy. It's chaotic. You learn wherever you learn. However, 
Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because the faculty here are in a similar position. They're in an yeah. enterprise that requires them to assign a grade at the end of a semester. And yet much of the technologies that they're now introducing to their students do the opposite. They give the students control to fragment and to be wherever. How do you reconcile those two, the chaos that of the space that you're well acquainted with versus the responsibility to a system that asks for a grade? Well, a really good way to think of it, and, and I've thought about that quite a bit in the last few days because in the last few weeks, because you know, as soon, as soon as everybody went online, the people who had always been there went, oh no, oh no, you can't do that. No, 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 only experts can teach online, which is a ridiculous thing to say. And the way I frame it in my own mind, especially I, if I'm speaking to professors, faculty, uh, you people have gone through, uh, I sound like Don Cherry, uh, have gone through bachelor's, master's, PhD programs, you have experience teaching. I doubt very much that any one of your classes that you go teach for, you spent four years writing that class. In fact, it's a ridiculous proposition, isn't it? What, it, what happens is all of your life preparation is enough that if you had to, I'm not saying you do, but if you had to, you could walk into that classroom cold and wing it. And that would be a perfectly good class. Now, oh, none of you have ever done that. I know that. I, you're, you're professionals and you've never walked into a classroom unprepared. But all that background does give you that capacity. Online learning is a lot like that. Um, I can come online, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, I can come into a room, into an environment, whatever, with my computer, my background knowledge, sit down, somebody says, I want to do such and such. Well, I pull this tool out, I pull that tool out, and bring something together, as I said in the post, like a DJ, and it does the job. I mean, it's not a miracle, and it's not impossible, and it's not flagrantly wrong to do that. Is that I have this background and this skill that is the preparation that was needed to do this job. Now, you're coming into online learning. Okay, maybe not so hot in the computer part. I get that. That'll come. Uh, but on the content side, I assume because you're teaching, you've already got the expertise. And that's what people want, right? They don't want you to be a wizard on the keyboard. They don't expect alk digital video alchemy. They expect somebody who's really expert in and excited by physics or geography or God help us macroeconomics. Just kidding there, macroeconomics is a science. Uh, uh, but you see what I mean? And so, you know, I've, I've been telling people like, no, you don't need years of, you know, uh, uh, years of course development and million dollar budgets or things like that. If you think of online learning as like TV, well, then you do. But since when have we thought of learning as like TV? It's not that. And in fact, it's the opposite of what we want. It's an interaction, it's a conversation. That's why there's two of us here on this video, even though I'm doing all the talk. Right, George? <laughs> yeah, you, I, I think you're, you're touching on a critical point, which is the, the uh, existent subject matter expertise that the faculty have is what students are there for. Now, the medium has changed, but someone who is passionate about their topic area, who's eager to see their students have positive learning experiences, will be able to communicate perhaps less effectively than a classroom, in some cases with some time and practice more effectively, but will be able to communicate the same passion and, and the same areas of interest. Uh, I was speaking uh, yesterday with uh, an administrator and he said that they managed to really move almost everything on the campuses at University of Texas, uh, Arlington, everything on campus with one subject area, which is glass blowing. 
uh, simply because they don't have a lot of people don't have furnaces at home suitable to the task. Yes, yeah, that, that given yeah, time that, you could build one. Given time, you know, given time you'd have local facilities, you know, like like the Living Arts Center in Mississauga has glass blowing facilities. I've seen them. Right? I I used to use that as an example. Right, and you know, I guess you can't do it right now with the with the pandemic. But you know, you you could go into the local living arts center, do some glass blowing, show what you've done on video, chat with your instructor, have a good laugh. You know. But yeah, I can see how glass blowing would be. But a lot of you know, but most stuff isn't. Even all the the physical stuff, the skill stuff. You can do a lot of stuff online because, you know, it's not like I'm locked to a keyboard. I used to be, but not anymore. You can take your phone with you, and, you know, video yourself anywhere. Yeah, and I, and I think the, the other thing that's uh, central to that is a little bit of creativity does go a long way. And, and one of the things I've tried to emphasize yeah. is that the online environment isn't better. It's not worse. It's different. It has it's a different, different set of rules or guidelines or different set of things that work well that's good to yeah. acknowledge uh, they shouldn't be seen as competitive spaces and i have no doubt that in six to 12 months or hopefully not much longer when things sort of start to get a bit of a normal feel that uh, there's going to be a pushback or a whiplash if you will against online technologies because a lot of people were forced into it under duress but to properly respect yeah. the medium requires an awareness that some things work well online when they're well planned. But I think your key point remains, if you are enthusiastic and focused on communicating your expertise, the medium isn't that consequential. Um, yeah. A final question for you, Stephen, is you've grown up in this medium for lack of a better word. And I remember years ago, you mentioned your, your cat uh, 30 years ago had the first website in the province of Manitoba, probably Canada for that matter. Now, if you're seeing a new faculty member who doesn't have your decades of experience in pursuing the latest technologies or engaging with the latest concepts regarding educational technology, what kind of advice would you give to someone who is now literally being handed a laptop, maybe a Zoom link, Canvas resources? What would you suggest that this professor do? Number one, relax. It's okay. Nobody expects perfection. In fact, the experts in the field expect you to bomb, and I know you're not going to bomb. So first of all, relax. Um, secondly, a lot of the skills that you already have are transferable. I, I know some people out there in cognitive psychology land say, oh, skills aren't transferable, but they are. Um, you have experience as a public speaker, uh, speaking in classes. That skill is transferable to the camera. Um, all you have to do is make the little jump in your mind that it's not a tool sitting there in front of you. It's a person, a one-eyed cyclops-like person, but still a person. Um, so that, that's something that's important. Third, don't take yourself too seriously. Have fun with it. It's an exploration. Um, you know, it's, it's like, I used to say, it's not so much anymore, but I used to say, I can tell when somebody is experienced with computers because they don't read the manual or the instructions. They just go through and push every button and to see what happens. Do that. Um, what could go wrong? I mean, more than what's already gone wrong in the world, what could go wrong, right? So try stuff out, have fun with it, right? Uh, it's pretty easy, especially now to catastrophize, but do the opposite of that. All those people, if you're listening to them at all and you shouldn't, all those people who say, no, this will never work, it can't be done, it can be done. I mean, I've made a career doing it. And if I can do it, anyone can do it, believe me. It can be done. And it can be done by 10 year olds who make more money at YouTube than I've made in a lifetime of research. Uh, it can be done 
by people living all around the world it can be done by you it's just you know it's just believing that you can i know it sounds like magical thinking right uh, i'll just believe and it'll no 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 it's not like that it takes work it takes persistence it takes patience it takes hitting all those buttons to see what happens but if you let yourself learn it you can let yourself learn it on your own and have fun and what you will discover this is a good thing that for me is that other people like to learn that way too and what you learn about learning as you learn this is going to change what you know about learning so far as teaching your own students is concerned and that's the probably the biggest take home that i've ever had in online learning that's a fantastic point to, on which to conclude because the reality is many of us now have an opportunity to while it's stressful and distressing but to really experience some of the disorientation that a student feels when they first uh, get enrolled in, in the university programs or when they have disruptions in their own lives it is not necessarily welcomed yeah. but with the right perspective it can be a positive professional development and learning experience yeah. in general well that's why i studied blockchain because i wanted to take something completely foreign to me and really hard yeah. You know, it felt like to not know anything and still start on it. Well, and, and the point of not knowing is frustrating, but to experience it yourself, it also helps you be more compassionate to others who are sort of in a comparable place. Yeah. Namely, all of our students, and if teachers, faculty are feeling a bit overwhelmed, imagine the experience of students who have the same stresses that they have, but uh, an entirely different set of unknowns going on in their personal lives. Yeah, that plus their future career depends on all of this. Yes. So yeah, there's a little stress there. Yeah, just a tad. Well, Stephen, a real pleasure to chat again. Uh, appreciate your insights. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, have a good course there, George. And hi, all you edX people. Have fun.